Greetings. My name is Mike Bankhead. I am your host. I am a bass player and songwriter from Dayton, Ohio. On this episode, let's go right on back to Texas, y'all. I have a nice conversation with singer, songwriter, and recording artist, Mariana Tirsa, and we talk about her new single. That's coming up right here on... The You Could Be My Aramis Podcast. Let's get to it. Hey there, Mariana Tirsa. Hey there, Mike. How you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm okay. I'm tired. I'm always tired. It's, <laughs> I think it's part of getting old. The fatigue of life. The fatigue of life. <laughs> I like talking to musicians. You're a musician. How about, do you have an elevator pitch? Let's, let's hear your elevator pitch. Ooh, my elevator pitch. We um, already practice at that, right? Absolutely. Um, and it depends on how tall the building is. <laughs> so, yep. if, um, so I'm Mariana Tiersa, and I make music as Runaway Force. Uh, I'm based in Austin, Texas, and uh, my music has a kind of Southwestern um, mysterious vibe to it. And um, I work with other musicians, but I'm a singer-songwriter and the band leader under Runaway Horse name. That's fantastic. Thank you. All right. So there's a lot to break down here. First, you're a songwriter. So let's get into your process. Awesome. When Mariana sits down to write a song, what are the tools? I always sit down at a piano, um, even though I play guitar and perform with the guitar. I write almost everything on the piano. I start, uh, well, the words and the music kind of go together so closely that I couldn't say one comes first. Um, so I'll just kind of tinker around until I find a little musical chord progression I like, and um, usually words kind of intuitively, I don't start with a theme. I don't think, oh, I'm gonna write a song about this topic. It's more like I let my unconscious bring words forward. And so then I'll have this chord progression and maybe a little phrase of words will come out. And then those phrase of words will kind of inspire me like, oh, this makes me think of this, or it taps into a feeling in my life. I'm like, oh, this feels like, what I'm going through about that. And then it becomes a little unfolding, like little click, 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 like the, the theme starts to unfold. And then probably after exploring that same kind of process at a certain point, I, I know this song is about this. And then I will start exploring that topic. So it could be like, oh, this is a song about uh, what I'm going through in my relationship with my child or in this experience I went through. And so then I will have the theme. So how do you know when it's done? How do I know when it's done? Well, I'll look at it structurally. I'll go, do I have verses and choruses? Do I have a bridge? So I'll look at it in terms of a traditional songwriting structure and say, do I have enough uh, words and music to contain a solid structure? Um, and then I'll ask myself, am I communicating the essence of the song sufficiently? Do I need another verse? Do I, do I need to take something out? But fundamentally, there's like a little internal bell that goes off. It's like a little feeling of like, I'm coming almost there, almost there, almost there. And then there's this sudden moment where I'm like, okay, it's done. But I always know that I could work on it forever or come back to it. But I trust that little place in myself that goes down. And I can't explain it other than it's an intuitive moment. Um, but I have a structure. I mean, I do follow a traditional songwriting structure. I love these questions. And I love yeah. talking about songwriting. <laughs> so. I, I think all of us who write songs love to talk about songwriting. And mm -hmm. hopefully... Hopefully, I think these conversations attract people that are either interested in knowing how it works or other songwriters who want to hear about everyone else's process. Because I don't think any two of us do it the same way, right? No, I'm, yeah. And it's also hard to kind of communicate like that internal feeling. Like that's so subjective, you know? It's, it's such a personal compass. And so, how do you, you know, 
like I can't really teach that to someone else and someone else might have a completely different compass than yep. mine. <laughs> So you mentioned you collaborate with other artists and the, the project name is Running a Horse. You just told us that you write on piano, and but your guitar is your main performance instrument. How do you decide where the song goes when you bring it to the other musicians, either to arrange for a studio recording or to arrange for a live performance? Uh, let's see. Can you, let's see. Can you clarify that again? Like how? I can. It actually is two questions. So let's, yeah, let's, take, the, let's take the, uh, you want to do the live performance one first or the studio one first? Uh, let's do studio one. All right. You have written this beautiful song on piano. You say, I have to release this as a single, like the one you just released a couple of weeks ago, but we'll get to that later. But the single is not going to be just you on a piano, probably. And it's not going to be just you on a guitar, probably. And you're going to collaborate with other musicians. How do you decide what the arrangement of that song is going to be like when you have other musicians joining you? Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, well, this is how I've worked up until now. I don't know how I'm going to work in the future, um, but up until now, I will bring the song to musicians that I that inspire me in some way by their musicianship. And I usually will just allow just total open for them to bring their interpretation. And when I listen to what they're bringing forward, I will kind of selectively say that's resonating that little doodle that you're doing or that tempo and then if i'm not if i'm not feeling it i just say can we keep trying some more like a brainstorming like let's just throw out ideas and i'm more like um sorting i'm in a sorting process and i'll go this one this is great i love that love that and then i'll let the musicians i'm working with like feed off of each other and then i i tend to be more of a like I'm shepherding the song and shepherding the musicians, but I'm not telling them do it like this. Um, but sometimes I'll have like influences that I'll be like, can we have it a little bit, some more uh, dreamy feelings, but I'm not telling them what, how to interpret that word dreamy. I just might say uh, dreamy <laughs> and they'll be like very frustrated. <laughs> like, what do you mean? <laughs> um so sometimes I'll be specific, like, hey, my guitarist, could you um, put more reverb and um, yeah, maybe do uh, not be so rhythmic and create like a loop or something? So I can get more specific. Um, it depends if we all get stuck with my words. I tend to use a lot of words from cooking or from nature. Like I'm known for saying something like make it more put more spice or cayenne or more cocoa powder into it they'll be like well what do you mean <laughs> like, and, or i'll say be it more like nature like this kind of bird and so i have to learn how to translate that into a musical language um but same thing is we'll start creating something and i'll just go with a certain feeling of like this feels good this has chemistry this has alchemy this is moving me personally and that will be my compass again um, so that's how I've worked so far. And I'm, I'm pretty happy with that process. It's not, it's sometimes a little confusing. Um, and it's very much my own personal, uh, aesthetic in the end, because I'm the one weeding everything out. Um, so in the end it becomes that I I've shaped something, but every one of those artists have, uh, musicians have put their mark, um, on my music. It wouldn't, my songs, the way they've come out so far, uh, you know, is definitely a very eclectic mixture of influences from different musicians that have participated well that's good that's what makes us that's what, that's what makes somebody sound unique i think but you mentioned that you might not be doing it that way in the future is there a particular reason for that um no i think that when i was first working that way it was more of like a band type of experience where it was like a we were together as a band and um that's how i was uh learning how to be the band leader with my songs and in the next albums, I might be more working with people as a work for hire. Um, but honestly, my, my, uh, that still is my style. I mean, that's still how I like to work. Um, I just, I may be a little bit more direct in the sense of like, I 100% want this, you know, do it exactly like this. I'd feel more permission that way if I was hiring musicians to say, hey, you know, I really want this exact type of sound and here's an example and do it like this. And if you can't do it like this, I have to hire somebody who could, but that's, that would probably be not 
the majority, I mean, that'd probably be once in a while I would do that. But the majority of the ways I'd work is probably the same way. Uh, I love working that way. I love, I love hearing what people bring. I love uh, being surprised. And I love the mystery of like the song, um, you know, evolving into something through everyone's contribution. So to me, that's part of the joy of recording and making music. So I don't think I would really change it a lot, honestly. Okay. Well, now let's talk about live performance. You finished a song. First of all, do you get the chance to test some of your songs out in front of a live audience before going to the studio? Maybe not now during the pandemic, but generally speaking. No, and I think I'm, I'm, if I was to kind of really clarify myself as an artist, I'm really more of a recording artist than a performing artist. Um, performance has always come secondary, both in terms of my enjoyment um, and in terms of also how much effort I put into it. Um, and I've also had a kind of a challenge of like trying to replicate what I've created in the studio um, on stage. And so there's just been a quite a big gap between those two things. Um, so now, you know, as post pandemic and as I, if I start performing again, um, I'm really trying to find a way to uh, get the sound that I've created in the studio to translate um, in a more minimal way in performing. Um, and I probably at that point will be testing song based on how they will they do, you know, the kind of feedback I'm getting, you know, through streaming or through fans online. It's like looking at, you know, what songs have really gotten the most plays and which, which ones are people liking the most. Um, and then I'll probably select the songs I perform based on that data. And that data, of course, is available for us as musicians if we feel like going to get it, right? It's, it's interesting to look back at the songs I, I um, released how long ago? gosh, eight years ago or a while ago now. And like some of the songs that were popular five years ago and other ones were completely ignored, it's now the reverse. And I'm like, oh, that one song nobody listened to five years ago, that's the one getting more plays now. <laughs> I had already decided, oh, I'm never going to play that song again. And now I'm like, oh, now everyone likes that song. <laughs> Music is always new to somebody, like even if it's eight years old, if somebody hasn't heard it, that makes it new to them. It's so important to remember that, you know? You have something that's new to everybody because it is not even two weeks old yet. And that would be your latest single, which is called The Man No One Sees. Talk yes. to me about that. Well, this song, uh, I released it. What, December 17th. It is I should a clarify before you yeah. continue, I'm going to apologize because I really should not interrupt you. That we are having this conversation on December 29th, but this episode, dear listener, you're listening to this in February. So by the time this goes up, the single will be just a little bit older, but still pretty new, right? Yes. So I'm sorry, Mariana, the man no who worries. sees go. Yes. So this is this uh, the song that I've released this uh, 2021 into, and it'll be going out a lot in 2022, um, getting people to hear the song. Um, this song is the second song off of an album I created about five years ago now, um, but I had kind of been sitting on the music. Um, and now I've been releasing singles off of that album. And so this is the second single off that album. And it just has such a beautiful, lush sound to it. Um, I recorded it in uh, Sonic Ranch Studios, which is in El Paso, Texas, uh, with this wonderful group of musicians I love, and uh, just came out so rich. It's fabulous. I'm so excited about it.
All right, so my favorite part about the song is is the bass, and of course I'm going to say that I'm a bass player. <laughs> it's just well executed. It, it really grounds the song. That's probably the best way I can describe it. And then also, I think you sound like Clove Sandoval, and she was always one of my favorite singers, uh, favorite lady singers in the '90s. So I think that's a pretty cool thing. What would you like now that the listeners have heard the song? What would you like them to take away from from their experience with it? Jeez. Well, what I'd like them to take away. Well, first I want to respond to what you said about the bass. So I have to give honors to um, Alan Burroughs, who is um, an Austin, Texas musician that nobody really knows <laughs> because he has never been a professional musician. Um, although he has got the chops to be a professional musician. And he, um, I met him when I was just at the beginning of my creating my music and when he came and he started playing uh, my songs, like my music went to a whole different place because of his rhythmic grounding and really like brought so much energy into my music and him combined with a different, uh, uh, not a different drummer, but just a dr the drummer, he and the drummer really clicked. Um, and they, and I just, through this huge appreciation for what a bass can do to a song, especially like my songs by themselves are just very mellow, very slow. But when you put a rhythm with a bass and a drums, it's like transports it a totally different world. So yeah, I'm so grateful for Alan Bros and um, Mazzy Starr and Hope, Hope Sandoval. She's been someone who I've been kind of uh, like, you know, a vocalist, someone I aspire to for forever. So whenever she comes up, I, I'm always grateful about that. She's a wonderful, the amazing artist. Um, yeah, so what I'm hoping someone will take away from uh, the man no one sees. Well, I hope it just reaches them kind of in a, in a way um, that's very haunting and beautiful at the same time. And it might be a little mysterious of like, not sure kind of 
what it means to them, but they're feeling something like um, that. Sometimes that experience that you get where it's a song where you're not necessarily tracking the words all the way, but you're really feeling it. Um, it's a great song for like road trips and like just allowing your yourself to go get dreamy and look out the window and float into space, you know, a bit. Um, it's also very, there's a kind of strong nature um, infusion in the song, both in the lyrics, but um, also the video I created. Um, so just like the feeling of the mountains and the forests. A lot of times people say my music makes them feel somehow connected to nature in some way. It's uh, So that's always a great thing when someone can feel that. Something I noticed about your lyrics is you use a lot of color words to describe scenes. The first line, baby blue eyes, right? Golden feather in, in, in his hair. But you also use a bunch of words that double us colors, even when they're not necessarily colors. And I feel like that's intentional. You've got a reference to lavender when you're talking about the actual flower, right? But that's the color. You've got a reference to evergreen. There's a line that says olive, cherry, oak. Those are all kind of colors in addition to being trees. Oh, that's so interesting. I've never noticed that. <laughs> wow. Maybe I'm ascribing something to your lyrics but not, that's not actually there. No, right? I... You did it subconsciously, perhaps. Yeah, no, I didn't notice that I put... But um, I was thinking recently about my, um, like... I created two videos, the last two songs, and they're super colorful. And I've been going, gosh, I really like color. <laughs> like, so the fact that you're telling me I put that in the lyric or that you notice that the lyrics, I think that's actually really um, helpful for me to recognize that one of the things I love is um, to communicate with is with color, both visually and um, maybe in lyrics too. I'll have to look the rest of my songs and see how often I, I refer to colors. I mean, it's it's definitely a very songwriting class nerdery, but they always tell us to show and not tell, right? And I feel like you've done, like this is an exemplary method of doing that. Songwriters, yeah. listen to this song again, either rewind it in the, in this podcast or better yet, because Mariana could probably use the 17 thousandths of a cent that she'll get from a Spotify stream. Go find her on Spotify and and stream the song like a thousand times, right? Yes, and you'll find me as Runaway Horse. So. Runaway Horse. So the question is, how many songs are on this album that, that you've been holding back? How, what, how many are we going to get? Six total. And at some point, well, since this is in the future when this is out, at some point this year, 2022, we will, you release the entire six together as, as a... Uh, I'm still planning. Right now, what I've planned is uh, to release two more one in the spring and another one again in the winter. So I'm kind of timing it with the sol the summer solstice and the winter solstice. That's the plan at the moment. I'm, I'm almost thinking that I might just like release the whole album in singles. And then when I get to the end, maybe create a cool B-side or create an acoustic version or add some kind of bonus tracks to the album. But I, the reason I want to do it that way is because I mean, I don't know the future of my musical career, but I think when I look back at my life, this is going to be my, some of my best work. And so I really want to spend time with, with each song and I don't want to have a song buried. And now people are consuming music that way anyway. So, probably, so then it would be basically the whole album would be released by 2023 with some kind of bonus version, whether I have no idea what that's going to be. That'll be fun to figure that out. Cool. Yeah. So then what we're going to have to do is when you put out that next song around the summer solstice, you'll have to come back and talk to me about it. Well, I'd have to do an interview with you in February. Right. We're going to schedule it. I'll do <laughs> better awesome. on the scheduling and we'll make it closer to release day. How's well, it's that? good that we're talking ahead. That's awesome. <laughs> it is. But yeah, I'll put it on my, I'll put it on my, uh, a reminder on my calendar to be on the lookout uh, for Mariana's upcoming summer release in get the conversation into the, the podcast episode can maybe even go up the same day you drop the song. That'd be pretty well, cool. Wouldn't be, we be amazing musician business people. <laughs> Synergy. I mean, That's right. you hate to think about the business part of it because I'm sure you just want to make art like the rest of us do. But if you don't think about the business part of it, no one's going to find your art, right? 
Absolutely. So yeah, planning ahead like this would be fabulous. Hey, so we will definitely do that. So dear listener, I know you haven't had enough of Mariana. If perchance you are bilingual, we're going to have a conversation in Spanish and that's going to go up on the next episode of this podcast. Even if you're not, come back and listen to it anyway. She's pretty awesome. As mentioned, in exactly one week, I will be running that second part of the conversation with Mariana Tirsa, and we speak in Spanish for that part of the conversation. Thank you very much for listening. If you get a chance, could you please subscribe to this podcast or like it, leave a review on the listening platform of your choice? I'd really appreciate it. 